So the unwavering request for wisdom is our topic for tonight. The unwavering request for wisdom. James 1, 5 to 8. Just a little bit of context. So last week we said James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, joy be to you. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let this perseverance bring about its perfect work, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we talked about that last week, um, how that can be easier said than done. Easier said than done. Um, it's hard to consider trials as stepping stones to maturity, that perfection that, that James is talking about. So James is essentially saying that if we can't see wisely, if we can't wisely see that, we should consider trials opportunities for joy because trials um, lead to the testing of our faith. The testing of our faith produces perseverance, and the perseverance leads to um, our perfection, God perfecting us through that process as someone would perfect gold, would purify gold in the crucible. So that's how we should view trials. But of course, like we said, easier said than done. So um, if we can't see things that way, um, James is saying that there's something that we likely lack. Uh, James 1, 2, and 4, it makes it uh, seem easier said than done because we typically do the complete opposite. When we have trials going on, we don't consider them uh, opportunities for joy. We we are sad. We are um, depressed in certain certain issues, um, instances, and, um, you know, a lot of times we're mad. So it's, it's like the complete opposite of what we would expect to do naturally. Now, we all know the uh, that... Um, the old movie Ghostbusters, you know, the theme was who you're going to call. You know, when something's strange in the neighborhood, who are you going to call? When you're going through trials, we often don't know what to do. We don't know what to think. We don't know how to feel a lot of times. Um, so who are we going to call? And we got to call on the Lord. So we often we often experience um, guilt. We might think, you know, maybe if I had done this thing differently, things would have turned out differently. We might um, experience confusion asking why me like why is God allowing this to happen to me does God love me is he punishing me like what's going on here so we often experience guilt confusion fear we might be thinking what else might we lose uh, what else could go wrong uh, what if what if what if um, we might have anger and anger sometimes you know it's, it's hard to be angry for a long time so after we get angry for a while um, it can subside and it can lead to hopelessness and anxiety and depression um, so we can go through a lot of these uh, different different feelings and emotions. But James is saying to cope with trials, to cope with trials, we need godly wisdom. We have to call on God. Who are you going to call when when times are rough? We got to call on God. That's what we got to call. So verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, that person must ask God who gives to all sincerely and without reproaching. And it will be given to you. Grammatically, it, it says if, but it's um, what's called a first class condition that implies its actuality. So it essentially means since you need wisdom, since you need wisdom as servants of the Lord, we need to ask for wisdom. So James is saying like, if you lack wisdom, but it basically is like, well, since you lack wisdom, you need to ask for it. And godly wisdom um, is a very important term in, G in James. He repeats this in James 3, 13 um, and through 18. We'll see that later. Now, for the Greeks, wisdom was about knowledge, cleverness, uh, learnedness. You know, a lot of times today we think people that are wise are the people with the college degrees and all the learning and doctor this and, and doctor that and the people that all these, you know, published materials. Um, but that's not how we see it in Scripture. In Scripture, uh, wisdom is practical, moral, spiritual insight that's given by God. It comes from God's grace. In the Old Testament wisdom literature, that is Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, wisdom is about living in God's world by God's rules. Living in God's world by God's rules. So wisdom kind of has a couple of components to it. It's both practical, that is, how to live by these rules, and it's also spiritual, that is, trusting in the one who makes the rules. So it's one thing to know the rules of right and wrong, but it's more important to know the one who makes the rules of right and wrong. 
You know, it's different to know what we should do versus to know why we should do it and know who said we should do it. So the important thing is trusting in the Lord. That's always the most important thing, and we'll get to that. And also there's a difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. So basically divine wisdom enables one to see things from the divine perspective, see things from God's point of view. Of course, we're not going to get the whole picture, but if we ask God for wisdom, he can let us know how we should do things. So understanding trials and how they can be occasions for joy, this requires divine wisdom. It seems so backward to us. Like, how can I consider a trial opportunity for joy? Well, James is like, well, we need wisdom. We need divine wisdom to understand things in this way. So later, James says in James 3, so James 3, 13 to 18 Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. So that was James 3, uh, 13 to 18. So James, he goes, he comes back to wisdom later on in uh, this, this letter. So we see that, you know, wisdom is, is not about what you know, but it's what you do. It's walking in wisdom. Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. And this wisdom, as he says, does not come down. He's not talking about the earthly wisdom that is unspiritual and devilish. He's talking about wisdom from above. So it's not just knowing certain things. It's about being peaceable, gentle, merciful, all these different things, and not hypocritical. There's also a relationship between wisdom and perfection. We see that in some other places in the New Testament. James talks about being perfect. Uh, being mature, as we said last week. He's going to repeat that word um, quite a few times in this letter. But in order to have that that spiritual perfection, that Christ-like character, that wholeness that we talked about last week, we need this divine wisdom, this wisdom from God. And like we said, there's a difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom um, of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 6, uh, Yet among the mature, we, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. Again, there's a connection between maturity and wisdom. Also, Colossians 1.28, It is he who we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature, that same word, perfect, teleos, in Christ. So wisdom is something that God has. Uh, Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the, of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Romans eleven, thirty three. So wisdom is something, it's an attribute of God. But it's also something that God gives. Something that God gives. And we'll, we'll see this back in Daniel. Remember back in the context that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he's asking all the, the wise men and the different astrologers and, and different guys who are um, known for interpreting dreams to interpret his dream. And no one can do it um, until, you know, Daniel comes around and he says in Daniel 2, verses 20, 23, and declared, may the name of God be praised forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. See, God is the one who gives wisdom. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God of my fathers, because you have given me wisdom and power. And now you have let me know what we asked of you, for you have let us know the king's mystery. This is the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. Jesus also says in Luke 21, 15, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. This is when his disciples are going to be um, dragged in front of court and different things, that Jesus would give them wisdom. 
Of course, when we talk about wisdom, we got to talk about King Solomon. So in uh, 1 Kings 10, 23 and 24, thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his mind, which God had put in his mind. God has wisdom that is part of his character, uh, but he also gives wisdom and puts it in people's minds. So we talked about how wisdom is, is about living by God's rules in God's world. Now, knowing the rules is one thing. A lot of times we know the rules. I know the speed limit of every road that I, I drive on, right? <laughs> I know how fast I should be going. <laughs> but knowing the rules is different from actually applying them and being guided by those rules. So wisdom, biblical wisdom is not just knowing right from wrong, but actually putting that into practice. And wisdom helps one discern between good and evil. It helps one say the right thing or do the right thing at the right time. This is a biblical definition of wisdom. So let's go back to First Kings and we'll see a little more about King Solomon. So at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Verse 7, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who was able to govern this great people of yours? Who was able to govern this great people of yours? So we, we always say that Solomon asked for wisdom, but technically he asked for a discerning heart, to discern good from evil. It's really the same wording as we see in the Garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge of the good and evil. So Solomon wants a discerning heart to discern between good and evil, between right and wrong. And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life, or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon, Solomon awoke, and he realized it had been a dream. So Solomon could have asked for anything. Imagine, like, you know, God saying, hey, whatever you want, it's yours. Just tell me what it is. How many of us would ask for wisdom? <laughs> I mean, we might ask for wisdom now or a discerning heart now because we know how it worked out for Solomon, even though he struggled later in life. But, um, you know, many, I want, I want long life. I want... You know, I want to be esteemed among people. I want to be famous. I want to be rich. All these things. But Solomon demonstrates the importance of wisdom. Wisdom is is um, of primary importance. Being able to discern how we should live in God's world. That is more important than almost anything else in life. Jesus says, reminds me what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 31. Um, and 33, do not, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So we got to keep first things first. We got to seek the Lord's kingdom, his righteousness. We want that godly wisdom in our lives. These are the most important things in life. So I just want to go back to Proverbs and get a little better understanding of the fullness of what biblical wisdom is and how important biblical wisdom is. And the book of Proverbs is just full, chock full of wisdom. So I want to encourage you all to uh, you know, maybe read a couple of Proverbs every day, if not the whole book. One of my, uh, my Hebrew professors said there's 31 chapters in Proverbs and there's in, in many months 31 days in a month. 
So if you read a, a chapter of Proverbs a day, you can go through the whole book in just one month. But Proverbs is full of wisdom. And um, in the beginning, it's it's written like a father writing advice to his son. So in Proverbs 2, verse 1 to 5, My son, if you accept my words and store my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If you call out for insight, cry aloud for understanding, look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. That's how we should be looking and searching for wisdom. In Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So again, wisdom is a gift from God and we have to ask God for wisdom in order to get this divine wisdom. Continuing Proverbs 2, 7 and 8, he holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. So this wisdom has um, an important function in our lives that it can protect us from a lot of hurt, harm, and danger. Of course, not every single instance of hurt, harm, and danger, but you know, proverbs are proverbial truths. They're more often than not. This is how it's going to be. Wisdom, wisdom also protects from wicked men and adulterous women, and wisdom must be sought. Proverbs 8, 35 and 36 says, for those who find me, this is wisdom being personified as a woman, lady wisdom. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. All who hate me love death. So Proverbs puts it very bluntly. You can choose lady wisdom or you can choose lady folly, you know, foolishness. And foolishness basically leads to death and uh, fearing the Lord, walking in wisdom leads to life. So it's the um, essential two ways theology, two ways to live, essentially. And uh, continuing, just want to get a good understanding of biblical wisdom. Proverbs 3, uh, starting at verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. That's why it's so important to memorize scripture. We've got to keep no things by heart so that we we'll know when situations arise, you know, a lot of times scripture just bubble up right within me. Like, hey, I shouldn't do that or I shouldn't do this or what should I say here? If you put that word in your heart, you know, Psalm 119, 11, thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. It can very, very much help us. Um, verse two, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Can I interest anyone in some biblical wisdom? <laughs> prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And we all know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Starting at uh, verse 13. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. So wisdom is very important. More important than rubies. And she can bring long life, riches and honor. So this is, these are all um, what the book of Proverbs tells us. This is more often um, than not will be true. Proverbs are, again, proverbial truths. So to verse 17, Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. This is Lady Wisdom, wisdom personified. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. So again, this is so important that wisdom is just important to our well-being. And it seems, as Proverbs suggests, physically and spiritually. And of course, as we know, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but wisdom and discipline fools despise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. It's Proverbs 9, 10 and 11. So Proverbs 1, 7, Proverbs 9, 10 and 11 are kind of, kind of brackets the first section of Proverbs. 
uh, Proverbs 1 to 9. And then it kind of breaks into the what we think of Proverbs, those short, pithy sayings start in chapter 10 and then go on to the end of the book. But 1 through 9 is kind of bracketed by this motto, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. And we talked about how, you know, the fear of the Lord, you got to keep first things first. We say it a lot of times in, in many things in life, but we got to keep first things first. So as far as wisdom goes, as far as intelligence goes, you know, people say, oh, he's so smart. She's so smart. They got straight A's. Straight A's don't matter if you don't fear the Lord. It doesn't matter what college you went to, your degrees, how much money in your bank account, what kind of job you have. If you don't fear the Lord, Proverbs is saying, essentially, you don't know the first thing about anything. Because that's the most important thing. Reverence and devotion to the Lord is the foundational principle of wisdom. It is inseparable from allegiance to God and moral living. So it's not just thinking about God a certain way, feeling about God a certain way. It's behaving. It's obeying the Lord. It's being devoted to the Lord. We'll see this in Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6 as well. Now, Mr. T <laughs> says you better ask somebody. I don't know if you can see that. He says you better ask somebody. Mr. T. Like we said last time, it's hard to translate in English, but this is a third-person command. Um, so often we say if anyone lacks wisdom, let that person ask God. Or, But really it's saying that person must ask God. It's a command. That's just hard to translate, but in Greek, it's this third-person commands. So James, again, he's commanding people to ask God for wisdom, just like he commands us to consider it all joy when we go through trials. These are commands. Now, wisdom is not acquired by effort. It's not about how hard you work at it necessarily, because it's acquired by asking God. Wisdom is a gift from God. God has wisdom, and that is an attribute um, that that, um, characterizes him, but he also gives it to people as a gift. But it's not a completely passive process because, as one scholar says, our our daily bread is from God. Everything we have from comes from God. Our our paycheck is from God. Right. Um, But we still have to work. You know, the food we have comes from God, but we still have to prepare it. Like so it's not just um, that there's no human responsibility for it in the same way. um, Wisdom is from God, but we still have to ask for for this wisdom. We can't reach perfection that is maturity without God's generosity, without God giving us this wisdom. And this is very similar to what Jesus says in the Gospels. So Matthew 7, verse 7, Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. Verse 11, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We serve a very generous God, a sincere God, who gives ungrudgingly, as we'll see. So James is like, you, you have to ask. You have to ask God, um, and you will receive this wisdom. So the fact that God is ready to give us wisdom should motivate us to pray for it. You know, I think about uh, our church scholarships, and um, a lot of times, from what I understand, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of scholarship money to be given out. Like we're very people are very very willing to give out the money, but um, so we're just sometimes it seems like they're they're begging people to uh, to uh, fill fill out the applications and things and and go through the the necessary processes because you know it's the generosity is there. So because people are so generous to give this money to give um, the scholarships, people should be chomping at the bit to try to get the applications in. And, and similarly, I'm just relating that to to here. But because our God is so um, so generous, you know, we that should be motivation. He's willing to give. He's just ready for it. So that should be our motivation to ask. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, it says that God is sincere. Now, this can mean um, without condition, without reservation, without ulterior motives, that he's a God of integrity. He's single, single minded, um, without any type of uh, duplicity. And he's going to contrast that with the double minded person, as we'll see later. So God doesn't have mixed motives. You know, some people, when they give us things, we don't know what their intentions are. A lot of times we say that there's gifts have strings attached to them, you know. So once somebody gives you a gift and you owe them money, now you're in their debt. Now you got to do this. Now you, it feels weird. It kind of changes the relationship. You know, when someone, when you owe somebody money, it kind of changes things, right? But James is saying that God doesn't have ulterior motives. He, he doesn't do that. It can also mean that God gives generously and he does do that. It can also mean that God gives without hesitation, that he responds immediately. So all of these 
facets of this word. It's a very unique word that's in the Greek here. And James, he might be aware of the richness of this word. He's using um, using it in a meaning, meaning all three of these different meanings. So that's uh, sincerely, single-mindedly, also generously, and also he responds immediately without hesitation. So in contrast to double-minded people, as we'll see in verse 6 and, and, and forward, God is single-minded and sincere. Now this is in contrast to the Greek and Roman gods. I know there's a lot of mythology about them, about them, how they were very capricious. They had to be bought off. They were didn't necessarily have humans' best interests at heart. They kind of did their own thing, and, and a lot of times they thought that they would have to be bought off or bought. So if you wanted to, for instance, um, get someone to fall in love with you or something like that, you would make sacrifices to Aphrodite. Or you know, if if your fields weren't growing crops, you would make sacrifice to another god to to buy them off in order to manipulate them so they could um, bring you favor. So it weren't like these these Roman and Greek gods, how they thought of them, they didn't really have integrity. Like they didn't really care as much uh, for the people. They had to be um, had to be bought off, as we said. So just a, a very different understanding of, of God um, from the pagan mindset to the biblical and the Christian mindset. Now, all here likely means all who pray, all who pray for wisdom. So there's no limit. There's no limitation to the invitation to trust in God. It goes for everyone. Anyone is free to trust in God, but God gives wisdom to everyone who belongs to him. And he gives without grumbling. Let's show this picture here. He gives without grumbling. He's, he's not going to uh, reproach us. Um, one who finds fault in a way that demeans the other is what this, this word means. God gives ungrudgingly and without making people feel guilty or stupid. So basically, God, he gives wisdom to people without holding their failures or lack of wisdom over their heads, not holding it against them. So without throwing faults in their faces, he doesn't give backhandedly. Um, so many times, you know, it seems like our pride prevents us from asking for help. You know, we don't want to ask for handouts because our egos or what have you, you know, it brings on this um, kind of like a bit of shame. You know, when you ask someone for help, you don't know if they're going to judge you. You're thinking like, what will they think of me? Or if you're like me, you have to keep asking your parents for money over the years. <laughs> like, well, you, you ask me for money again, like you got to do this, <laughs> you know, you know, so you know, when you ask, you're kind of opening yourself up to uh, reproach or opening yourself up to be scolded. Um, but that's not the way that God gives, is what James is saying. He's not finding fault in people without reproach. He's not going to mock you. He's not going to rebuke you for asking. He's not going to say, you need help again. Like, didn't I just give you, you know, money last time? <laughs> um, so God, he gives without reluctance, without complaint, without criticism. God gives freely. Now, a lot of people, they'll take verse 6 and run with it. Verse 6, but they must ask in faith, not wavering in doubt. For the one who doubts is like a surge of waves on the sea, being blown by the wind and tossed back and forth. So a lot of people will will take uh, this verse and think that this is basically a name it and claim it. That whatever you get, uh, whatever you ask for, and as long as you believe it, then God is going to give it to you. But one does not simply name it and claim it, as it's been said. We'll see this in Matthew 21. People cite these scriptures. Matthew 21, verse 21 and 22. Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So many people say that, you know, as long as you have faith, God will give you anything. You can throw mountains into the sea. We've got to understand the, the context. John 14, 13, 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, Jesus says, and I will do it. So it's not just anything and everything we can just ask God he's going to give it to us as long as we just believe and think really hard that's going to happen that's not what this is saying in my name means according uh, to God's purpose and James is going to talk about this later in chapter 4 so chapter 4 verse 3 when you ask you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures 
So James know that God is not going to give us anything and everything that we want. Because a lot of things that we ask for, we don't need. And we do it for our own pleasure. So this is not name it and claim it. This is not a health and wealth false gospel. God does not just give us um, a blank check. Some people think that God just wrote us a blank check and we can fill whatever we want, whatever we want on that check and God is going to cash it for us. But that's just not how, not how it works. We can't pray for whatever we want, believe and not doubt that God will grant it and expect God to give it. God is not a fairy godfather. He is not a fairy godfather. And it's unfortunate, I think many people think of God like this, that, you know, God just exists to help us fulfill our dreams, that we just click our heels three times or whatever it is, and, you know, God is going to come down with some pixie dust, fix everything for us, and not demand anything from us. And that's just a, um, a poor view. We cannot manipulate God with our own power of positive thinking. God is sovereign. He's the one in charge. So we can't just um, think we can manipulate him and, and pull his strings. This is also not a type of self-hypnosis where we just um, convince ourselves that God's going to give us whatever we ask for. And then we got to push all of the doubts out of our minds. So we've got to ask and believe and believe and not doubt at all. And God's going to give it to us. Sorry, That's not what James is saying here. That's not the kind of doubt that James is talking about. So true faith is not believing God will grant our every petition. It is believing that he will do what is best for us in every situation. We got to have what's called um, even if faith. There was um, a pastor at a church nearby here in Philadelphia, and um, my wife was listening to um, the sermon, and um, he was saying that fear will have us asking, "What if?" You know, especially in times of the coronavirus right now, there's a lot of what ifs. You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? But a true, genuine faith will have us thinking. Even if. So not what if, but even if. And this comes from uh, Daniel 3, 17 and 18. We'll see this with um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. He's able. He's always able. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up, even if. So not a what if fear, but a even if faith. Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job thirteen fifteen. And we can remember that Jesus says um, in the garden, you know, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So just saying that we have to have an even if faith, even if this doesn't work out for us, even if we perish, even if um, God doesn't do what we want him to do, that we should still have faith and trust and confidence in the Lord. Not what we will, but thy will be done should be our prayer. So having faith, as we said, is not merely being confident that God is going to give us what we pray for. That's not biblical faith. So we talked about it last time, uh, faith is basically a total unwavering confidence and trust and dependence on the Lord, which manifests itself in obedience, as we'll see in James 2, verses 14 and 26. So it's not merely intellectual assent or a certain feeling. Faith is active trust. I like that definition, active trust. It's, it's trust that's put into action. Jesus says, in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? We can't claim to trust God and then not trust in him. We can't claim that Jesus is our Lord and then not obey him as our Lord. So James is saying before one prays to God, one should be committed to God. And this promise is not for anyone and everyone necessarily. It's, it's really for believers. James is writing to believers. Um, to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. We talked about that a lot last week. And my question is, why will we expect God to listen to us if we don't listen to God? Why do we expect God to listen to us if we don't listen to God? This question, you know, a lot of times people ask us favors. And if it's someone we know really well, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll help you out. But if it's just some random person, you'd be like, do I know you? Who Who are you? <laughs> 
And I think similarly, if someone doesn't know the Lord, have that relationship with the Lord, you know, why would they expect God to do them a favor? And we'll talk about that. Another picture. <laughs> when someone says, can you do me a favor? <laughs> you know, it depends who's asking. It depends if that person is close to me, I'm going to be more likely to do them a favor. If I know them, if I have a relationship with them. So I'm going to show you some scripture. Again, why would do we expect God to do what we want when we don't do what he wants? So Proverbs 28, 9. Proverbs 28, 9. When one will not listen to the law, the instruction, Torah, even one's prayers are an abomination. Proverbs 28, 9. Even one's prayers are an abomination. If we are not fearing the Lord, if we're not revering the Lord and obeying the Lord, if we're not listening, Scripture suggests that he's not listening to our prayer. He's not hearing our prayers um, in a way that he's going to move necessarily. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Proverbs 15, 8. Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. So we have to always come to God in faith. That is um, what I would argue um, in an uh, active, trusting relationship with God. People that come to God in faith are those who are faithful to God, those who are loyal to God, those who are devoted to God, which is manifested in their, their obedient lifestyle. So that's what it means, I would argue, to come to God in faith. Not just thinking that God is going to do what we think he's going to do, what we want him to do, but that we are being faithful to God. We acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior with our words and with our works and we are coming to him in that faithfulness every every type of prayer to god entails a certain kind of faith but james is, is talking about he's speaking against a certain manner of prayer a prayer with a divided mind and we'll see what that means so the word literally is is wavering um, it means to be divided against yourself to waver between two alternatives to dispute with oneself is a literal um, translation or more little translation of this word to doubt. So it's not just, oh, I don't think it's going to happen, but being at war with yourself, within yourself. So it's not about doubt doubting that God is going to act, but rather to have a divided, divided mind that keeps one from trusting God in the first place. So not about a certain specific request, but doubting God in general. Not about specific requests, but doubting God in general. So it's not about doubting whether um, or not a certain request is God's will. And it's not doubting one's worthiness about the request. It's not about doubting if God exists, but doubting the kind of God that exists. It's essentially calling his character into question. This type of doubting is calling God's character into question. So doubting is essentially wavering, wavering between trust and distrust of God, wavering between trusting in God and trusting in oneself. A wavering commitment to God. So we must be confident that God will answer our prayer for wisdom. But we should have faith in God, not only when asking for wisdom, but in every area of life. So um, this is about wavering in our commitment to God. So the person must have faith, ask in faith. That is, they're being faithful in their lifestyle. We've got to remember that this, this context is about God graciously granting wisdom, especially in the midst of trials. So when we ask in faith, here, James is talking about wisdom. So a lot of times people take this verse out of context and say, if we can't doubt about anything, we believe this, that God's going to give it to us. But James is talking about God promising to give us wisdom. So God promises to give us wisdom concerning how we should live when we're going through certain trials. So this is not saying that we shouldn't doubt anything. Apparently there was this guy who... Uh, back in the early 1900s, who sold the Brooklyn Bridge, like a couple of times, I think. He literally sold the Brooklyn Bridge. I think his name was George Parker. And um, they eventually locked him up for it. He was selling all this property that wasn't his, and he got sent to Sing Sing for life. <laughs> and, of course, we, we had that saying that, um, oh, if you believe that, I got a bridge I want to sell you. And I think that comes from him. So we're not saying that you shouldn't doubt anything. There's a lot of things that we should doubt, we should question. So it's not about doubting um, at all. And it's likely not about superficial doubts or about honest doubts 
that are expressed to God. Like and also not about questioning God's will. Um, if you read the Psalms, psalmists often express their honest doubts um, in their, their songs to the Lord, but they ended in praise and trust because they remember God's goodness in the past. You'll see that in Psalm 77, verses 7 to 12 especially. So for example, in, in Psalm 13, it says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? That's uh, Psalm 13, 1 and 2. But then he ends, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. So we'll see this a lot in the Psalms, that the psalmists are very honest with God. They, they bear their emotions, their doubts, their, their desires, their wills. Lord, we need you to come. They'll even their, they call down curses on people. Psalms are very um, explicit in that way, very honest. So we can be very honest with God um, because he knows, he sees through our holy talk. When people say, how you doing? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm this and, you know, God's got it and, and blessed and highly favored. Um, we have our sayings. I'm not saying they're not true. I'm just saying that sometimes we just say those things and we know that we're not honestly feeling that way, but we don't want to, you know, reveal it to certain people. Anyway, God, he sees through all of our holy talk, our Christianese. God knows what's on our hearts. Um, we say we won't complain, but you can complain to God because he knows what you're going through anyway. So God knows our thoughts. He knows these kind of doubts. Um, yet he gives sincerely and generously without throwing our failures in our faces. So again, James is not talking about um, having these kind of intellectual doubts or doubts about is God going to do this or not, but it's more about doubting God's character. Doubting that God is a gracious God who gives. Doubting um, in our wavering commitment to the Lord. That's what the doubting that is in this passage is about. So he's not writing about intellectual doubt, but about divided spiritual commitment and devotion to the Lord. And he says it's like, a, it's like waves on the sea, uh, very uh, unstable, this person. So James uh, likely grew up near the Sea of Galilee. The Jews, they didn't really mess with the water like that unless they were fishing. They didn't... Um, necessarily think of it too highly. They thought the, the water symbolized disorder and evil um, and uncertainty. Uh, the Romans, they were afraid of the sea's unpredictability and its destructive power. Some viewed traveling by sea as, as foolish. You know, of course, now we're on boats all the time, but back then, um, a lot of people didn't really mess with the water like that because some crazy things happened in the water. Um, Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. No peace, no shalom for the wicked. That's where that, that saying comes from. Um, so the wicked are always going back and forth, just like the waves. They're unstable. So some people go up and down like the waves. Sometimes they're centered on God. Other times they're centered on this world. Sometimes they're centered on God. Sometimes they're centered on themselves, um, and they're constantly in flux like the seas. And this is the way to spiritual seasickness. So I don't know if you've been on a boat. Some people can, can stay in boats. Uh, I never got seasick, but I just know if I'm on a boat too long, just watching this picture just makes me a little seasick. You know, I don't like that feeling of always being in, in constant motion, even if it's not too much motion. The waves that James is describing here are likely a surge of waves. If you're always going up and down, that's how you get seasick. So we can't waver in our trust between God and this world. Um, we always have to, to trust in God and not in ourselves. We can't waver between faith and skepticism. We know people can be blown here and there by every winds of false teaching and others' opinions and persecutions. We see that in Ephesians 14. It all talks about um, being mature, that God gave you know, the leaders of the church so that the whole church be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and maturity. We talked about that last week. And in verse 14, he says, Then will we no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature teleos, the perfect body of him who is the head, that is Christ. That's why it's so important to speak the truth in love so that people can mature in their faith, be perfected in their faith. 
So the testing of our faith that we saw last week produces perseverance. But if we're always doubting and wavering, that makes us unstable. We can't stop trusting God when the trials come. We can't be fair weather fans that are only on God's side, only on God's team when things are going well. Especially when things are going wrong, that's when we really have to trust on the Lord. And we have to ask for this wisdom. So verse 7, as we start winding down, that person must not expect that they will receive anything from the Lord. The person who doubts shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now we know that in Matthew 5, uh, 40, 45, the God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So in a certain sense, God gives to everyone, whether they acknowledge him or not, whether they're faithful or not. But there is more we can miss out on if we do not pray in faith. Pray in that faithfulness, that commitment, unwavering commitment to the Lord. And this is another third person command. People sh uh, with divided loyalties. People with divided loyalties should not expect God to reward their double mindedness. Now, that doesn't mean that God's not going to give them anything. Because like we said, God will give, he sends his son on the, the evil and the good. Sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So they're going to get something. Like everything comes from the Lord. We know that. But they shouldn't expect to get anything um, in a certain sense. They shouldn't expect it. Um, there's, just other, there's, there's additional things that we can get from the Lord. Namely, in this instance, divine wisdom. That someone who is doubting, someone who's wavering, should not expect to get that if they're wavering in their commitment to the Lord. So James, he's likely focusing less on being two-faced, saying one thing, doing another. There's probably an element of that here. But it's likely more... Um, about having two faces looking in opposite directions. So somebody, like we said, who's at war with himself and thinking of going this way and then thinking of going that way. So they're like two faces facing opposite directions. I have a, a picture up there. We see this in the Old Testament, um, Psalm 12, 2. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. There's a lot of talk about double hearts. God wants us to love him with our entire our entire hearts, our whole hearts, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But some people um, have double hearts, as that's been said in the Old Testament. So James is saying they're, they're going to be double-minded and double-tongued. So in verse 8, a double-minded individual, unstable in all their ways. Our last verse for tonight. Um, very similar, this word is also used in James 4, 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You double-minded. Literally, it means uh, double-souled, two-souled, a person with two souls. And James, he may have coined this term. We don't actually have any evidence of anyone using it in Greek literature before James. So he's kind of like maybe making up a word here. But someone with two, in the Old Testament, was with someone with two hearts or a divided heart. James is saying you have two souls. You're trying to go in two different directions. And that kind of person shouldn't expect to get anything from the Lord. So it's not about superficial doubts, but someone, as we said, who is divided within themselves. Someone who lacks single-mindedness. Someone who's torn between conflicting desires and wills. Torn between this world and the way. That is the way, the truth, and the life. So fickle people um, who waver between self-reliance and God-reliance. These are people that James is talking about, fickle people. In Scripture, there's no safe middle ground between faith and unbelief. There's no middle ground. You're either with Jesus or you're not with Jesus. You're with God or you're not with God. And this is the two ways uh, theology, as we'll see later. So with God, we cannot have divided loyalty. We cannot have divided faithfulness in our hearts, divided trust. We have to put all our eggs in one basket. A lot of times we say, don't put all your eggs in one basket, because if the basket breaks, then you lost all your eggs. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's no other basket that's worth our eggs. we got to put all our eggs in God's basket. I got a picture. Oh, you got a picture there. Yeah, so <laughs> put all the eggs in God's basket. You can't, can't, you know, try to split it up between, you know, a basket here for the Lord and a couple eggs here for the world, a couple eggs here for myself. Put all your eggs in God's basket. So we are to love, that is, in biblical terms, to love someone, the covenantal love, be devoted to them, be loyal to them. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart. We'll see this in Deuteronomy 6, 5. This is the great Jewish Shema, which the Jews would recite every day, even to this day, 
Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And of course, Jesus quotes this when he's asked about which is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So your whole undivided heart should not be any wavering in your heart, in your commitment to God. We like this scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So last week we talked about the Jewish exile, the dispersion. Um, so this is Jeremiah's writing to people that are um, in exile and, um, and the Lord is speaking through him. We see that same um, theme, seeking the Lord with all your heart, not some here and some there. You know, we have to give it all to the Lord, undivided heart. Jesus says in Matthew six twenty four, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So scholars just disagree about um, the context the um, the life setting, who the audience was that James was writing to, and what they were going through, but it seems that some of them may have been trusting in their wealth, um, and we'll broach that topic next week, Lord willing. Uh, many turn to God when they have nowhere else to turn. That is when their riches fail. So nowadays, you know, people many are out of work, many um, can't see people. Like all of our other places where we put our trust are gone. For many of us, so many people are turning to the Lord now. We see that. I read some good stories about doctors who were atheists and now turning to God. But God should not be our last resort. God should be our first, our first stop. You know, but that's just kind of how it is. A lot of people trust in their wealth, they trust in their stuff, and then when all that's gone, um, they have nowhere else to turn. James also says in chapter four, verse four, "You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God?" Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. We need an unadulterated faith. That's what we need. James is going to say we got to keep ourselves from being polluted from the world. We can't love the world or anything in the world, 1 John 2.15. So we'll talk about that later, hopefully, when we get to it. But we can't have our um, divided loyalties between us and the world and God. We can't have this self-trust, but also trust in God or trusting in the world and, and wanting what the world wants and desiring the world, but also desiring God on the other side. No, we got to be singularly focused, single-mindedly focused on the Lord and not double-minded, as James says. We can't straddle the fence. We talk about that people won't get off the fence. Got this cat here, this cat straddling the fence. You don't know what side of the fence he's going to be on. <laughs> but we have to be, um, we got to make a choice. We can't be nominal Christians. That is, people that are Christian in name only. Christians in name only. We have to actually be followers of Christ that actually follow Christ. You can't just call yourself a Christian if you're not following Christ. We need a total commitment to God and total rejection of evil. It says they're unstable in all their ways. Now, ways, based in the Old Testament, your way was your way of life, your conduct, how you conducted yourself on a daily basis. Essentially, there's two ways to live life, uh, a godly way, a wise way, a righteous way, and then there's the foolish way. You see that a lot in Proverbs. There's the way of the wise, the way of the fool. Um, you see that um, in our Old Testament literature, and Jesus says that there's a narrow gate, and there's a wide gate. There's false prophets, there's true prophets. There's good trees, there's bad trees. There's good fruit, there's bad fruit. There's true disciples, there's false disciples. Matthew 7, verses 13 to 27, um, and there's wise builders and foolish builders. Jesus says, those who um, hear my words and put it into practice are like the man who built his house on the rock. Other people build their houses on sand. So again, there's two ways to live, essentially. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. 
And it ends in verse 6, for the Lord, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Again, the way is about their, their, their way of life. Psalm 119, verse 1, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law, the Torah of the Lord. But basically, it's hard to trust someone who doesn't know whom to trust. The unstable person has divided loyalties. They don't know to trust themselves, to trust the world, or to trust in God. And they have a double mind. It says people with divided loyalty are unstable in all they do. Their whole existence and not just their spiritual life, as has been said. Um, there's an emphasis on action. They're unstable in all they do. Um, how we think influences how we behave. So one thinks of the instability of drunkards. Um, as one scholar says, the double-minded are morally incapacitated. Now, when I, when I was a DJ, I would, uh, you know, I did lots of parties over the years, countless parties. I would never partake in alcohol, never had a, a drink, actually. But I was always around it because I'm at parties. Now, the thing is that people see a table at a party and they want to put their drink down to the table. And I know from experience that when they put it down, they're never coming back for it. So I'm like, no, get your drink away from me and get away from me. Because <laughs> when I see a, a drunk person or someone who's tipsy or whatever you want to call it, I'm like, nope, they're unstable. I don't know what they're about to do. They're unpredictable. All these things. And I'm sure you know many of us can relate to that, man. So when I see an unstable person like that, I'm like, nope, I just want to stay away. Just, just stay away from my stuff, my equipment. Don't break anything. Just leave me alone. So similarly, the instable, the morally instable people that are unstable in their, in their commitment to God are unstable in all they do. And they can cause damage. And unstable, unstable people will be blown here and there during trials. You know, if you're not anchored in the Lord, then you're definitely going to be blown around in the trials of life. So one scholar says, if we are not secure with God, then we are not secure at all. Our insecurities likely show more during trials and tribulations. Now, uh, last week, I, I didn't really get to it, but um, I had a picture of some tea. Now, when you want to find out how good some tea is, you have to put it in hot water. And a lot of times, our tests and trials can bring some hot water in our lives and see what kind of tea we are, see, see what, what our true colors are. We know that you kind of see your, you see someone's true colors in times of adversity. Uh, these, um, these trials and tribulations, there's a testing element to them. There's a testing that is developing us and perfecting us, but there's also a testing of a revelatory nature. It's revealing something about us. So those who are in, that are unstable, their insecurities are going to show more during these trials and tribulations. So basically, uh, if you're unstable, you, you lack commitment to God, it affects every area of your life. Because there's no moral compass. If you're not following God, but you're following God sometimes, and then the people sometimes, and yourself sometimes, you're unstable. Now we have to resist the temptation of self-trust. And I just want to you know, end with this, that this world preaches the doctrine of individual responsibility and rugged independence. Everyone says, believe in yourself, trust in yourself. Don't, doesn't matter what anyone else says, just believe in yourself. Just think really hard, think positive. Just work hard. You can do it. You'll you'll have success. And this is like the stock wisdom of the day. This is the worldly wisdom. And we have to get away from that because we're not supposed to believe in ourselves necessarily. This doesn't mean, you know, don't have good self-esteem. I'm not saying that. But don't put too much stock in yourself and your ability to just figure things out on your own. So just a couple scriptures here I want to end with. Those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Proverbs 28, 26. We know this one, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Biblically speaking, being wise in your own eyes, like trying to figure things out all on your own, trusting in yourself, that is the way of the fool. That is the way of the fool. 1 Corinthians 3.18 Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Proverbs 26.12 Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. So again, 
our culture preaches believe in yourself, but we got to believe in God. We got to trust in God before anything else. Many might see trials and, and troubles in the world as proof that God does not care. A lot of people think that there is no God because there's evil in the world. But godly wisdom, this divine wisdom, this heavenly perspective, as we said last week, it sees trials and tribulations as opportunities for growth, as opportunities to actually rejoice because of the growth that they can bring up and produce in our lives. So again, we need this godly wisdom, but we have to ask for this godly wisdom. So as we wrap up, when we fall into trials and we don't know what to do, we need this godly wisdom. Therefore, we must ask God for wisdom. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear that is the reverence and allegiance to the Lord. And this wisdom differs from worldly wisdom. There's a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. When we ask, we must ask in faith. That is putting our confidence, trust in God, our active trust in God, our obedience, allegiance, loyalty, without any division in our hearts. God is sincere in his giving, Will we be sincere in our asking? We should pray single-hearted prayers to our single-hearted God. God is sincere. God has integrity in his motives. We should be sincere and not double-minded in our motives. Like God, we should say what we mean and mean what we say. We cannot waver in our faith in God's grace. Those with divided loyalties have no genuine commitment or stability and should not expect, to, should not expect God to answer prayers for wisdom. A Christian doubter is an oxymoron. A Christian doubter is an oxymoron. We cannot doubt the grace of God and the character of God. We should not waver in our commitment. Such people are spiritually unstable, but our souls are anchored in the Lord. Hebrews 6, 19. We sing that song, but my soul has been anchored in the Lord. So God, once again, gives wisdom generously, sincerely, without throwing our faults in our faces, without reproach, without finding fault. So this should, ask, this should motivate us to ask God for wisdom, to ask, seek, and knock for wisdom. We must consider it joy when we go through trials, which test our faith, which produces perseverance, which leads to our Christ-like perfection, that is maturity and wholeness, leads to our wholehearted character. We should love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with our whole hearts. When we're going through trials and tribulations, these are opportunities to turn to God in prayer, asking for his gracious gift of divine wisdom. We must be single-mindedly, totally devoted, that is faithful to the Lord. We can't have spiritual seasickness going up and down or spiritual schizophrenia when we're thinking one way and thinking the other way. And this is a theme that runs throughout James. Our words, our thoughts have to match our actions. We have to be completely, wholly, singularly devoted to the Lord and all that we do.